All right, so when it comes to choosing the right microphone for voiceover, what are the things that you need to look out for and understand in order to make the correct choice for you? If you already have a microphone, leave me a comment below as to what microphone you've chose and why you chose it. Now, make sure to stay until the end of the video to find out the most important piece of the puzzle when it comes to recording professional sounding audio. Also, if this video is helpful to you and you'd like to support me and the channel, I have a link in the description to all the microphones and other equipment that I recommend. And if you order from those links, I do get a small commission at no extra cost to you and it helps me keep this channel going so that I can keep making more content like this. I really appreciate it. All right, let's get into it. There are so many microphones out there to choose from, and when you're just getting started, choosing one microphone out of the squillions of microphones out there can be a bit overwhelming. But here's the thing, it's actually not as overwhelming as it may feel initially if you know exactly what to look for. So let's break down what those things are, shall we? First things first, USB microphone, or XLR microphone. Well, before we even get to which one will work best for you, let's break down exactly how they work for those who may not know. An XLR microphone requires two things in order for it to work, an XLR cable and an audio interface. Your XLR microphone will plug into the audio interface via the XLR cable, whereas the USB microphone completely leaves out the audio interface altogether. You just plug the USB microphone straight into your computer via the USB cable that will likely come uh, with the microphone when you purchase it. Now, as I predicted a couple of years back, some USB microphones have drastically improved, almost to the point of being on par with XLR microphones. But like I said, some of them, there's still quite a few, actually the majority that aren't there yet. But if you know which ones to buy, then you're golden. We'll get to that later on in the video. Now, for me personally, I still prefer using XLR microphones with an audio interface. It gives you more flexibility and the workflow is much more efficient. So really quickly, why would you choose an XLR microphone over a USB microphone? I mean, a USB microphone doesn't even require an audio interface, so doesn't that mean it will be easier to use? Well, not really. It can kind of bite you. If you don't get a USB microphone with a gain knob on the microphone, setting your gain properly before you start recording, which is one of the most important parts of recording audio, means that you now have to dive into the audio settings within your computer to adjust your levels. It may not sound like much, but it can actually get really annoying after a while. Now, it's definitely not a deal breaker, but it's worth mentioning. Also, most of the cons I had about USB microphones just a couple of years ago have mostly been eliminated now, which is pretty awesome. Technology. So I'm not here to give you a ton of reasons as to why you should not buy a USB microphone. I just want to give you the knowledge that you need in order to make sure you make an informed decision and buy the right USB microphone if that's what you're going to do. I'll get to that towards the end of the video. Now, when it comes to an XLR microphone, remember, in order for it to work, you'll need an XLR cable and an audio interface. Well, why does this make it easier rather than just using a USB microphone? because I mean, it's more complicated, right? I mean, after all, you now need to learn how to use and set up your audio interface, right? Well, that's actually a lot easier than you've probably been led to believe. I have an entire video covering how to learn and set up your audio interface in the description below. I promise it's so, so, so much easier than you might think. But the main reason this makes everything easier having an audio interface is simply because you have the gain knob right there at your fingertips. It may sound ridiculous, but having it right there on your desk will pay for itself over and over again. I mean, you definitely could just leave it out in your control room like I do and just go into your booth, set your levels and just just record and then come out and edit, you know. But still, if you're one of those people that, you know, is constantly changing your gain and you don't like the idea of setting your gain and then going in and recording and just hoping that you don't clip or whatever, if that's just something that bothers you in the back of your head, this is definitely the way to go. You know, adjusting the gain when recording voiceover work will be a continuous endeavor. It just depends on what you're recording. And what you're recording will differ vastly. So it's really nice to make your job as easy as humanly possible. Convenience will help you pump out more auditions more quickly, which will up your chances of booking, assuming you're not flying through them too quickly and not giving your best during the reads. You have to find that balance and any little thing that you can do to help speed up your workflow or improve your workflow will be way more efficient and it will always inch you closer and closer to success. If your turnaround time is in the top 10% and your speed doesn't negatively affect your quality, uh, you'll inevitably just become more and more bookable. 
One other thing to note here is that 99.99999% of professional studios out there are going to be using an XLR microphone when recording voiceover, so it's always nice to emulate what the pro studios are doing. It only makes you look better. But also, a very important thing to note, USB microphones are still viewed as unprofessional in the voiceover industry, so that right there might just make up your mind as to whether you should buy a USB mic or an XLR microphone. And now, I, I want to be very clear about this. That doesn't mean that you can't use a USB microphone. You absolutely can, but I still wanted to make that note. I'll get to the perfect USB mic to start out with later in the video, and it will kind of help solve these issues anyway. All right, so now that we've covered USB and XLR, and now that you've made that choice, you now need to make another choice. Large diaphragm condenser microphone, shotgun microphone, or a dynamic microphone. Which type should you go with when it comes to voiceover work? Well, just to go ahead and get this out of the way, don't go with a dynamic microphone like the Shure SM7B or any other dynamic microphone. That is, if you plan to make this a career and it's not just a hobby that you're doing for fun. Now, if you're doing it as a hobby, just for the fun of it, you just really enjoy voiceover and all that good stuff, then you absolutely can use a dynamic microphone. And to be really clear, this isn't my opinion. This is what the industry standard across the board is. My opinion is that dynamic microphones should be accepted across the industry. But at the time of making this video, that still isn't the case the industry doesn't want voice actors using dynamic microphones for a few reasons. But, you know, depending on when you're watching this video, that may not be the case anymore. If you're curious as to why that is, why they don't want you using a dynamic microphone, check out the video I made all about that, where I just go into a lot of detail as to why they don't want you using a microphone like the Shure SM7B. That's the mic I use in the video, but it could just be any dynamic microphone. It covers them across the board. And, you know, not every single one of the points that I make in that video are are still true to this day, but they mostly are. Um, I'm actually thinking about just redoing that video, re-recording that video with all of the updated information, um, as well as, you know, how I feel about it. I'll probably do that sometime soon in the next month or so. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Until then, I'll put the link to the other video in the description. And whenever I actually re-record it, I'll just swap out the video. So link in the description. All right, anyway, when it comes to voiceover work, you're gonna be choosing between a large diaphragm condenser microphone or a shotgun microphone. Both are used pretty evenly in the industry, so you've just gotta find which one will work best for you and your specific situation. So let's start with the large diaphragm condenser microphone. When it comes to the voiceover industry, you've likely seen a large diaphragm condenser microphone like uh, the TLM-103 or the Neumann U87. Those are two of the most famous large diaphragm condenser mics used in the industry. I'm just gonna say LDC from now on because large diaphragm mics is a mouthful and it's, it's annoying. LDC microphones are really sensitive and they will pick up every little detail in your recording space, whereas shotgun microphones, although still very sensitive, have a tighter pickup or polar pattern, meaning they won't pick up every little detail in your recording space as much as a large diaphragm condenser microphone will. So if your recording space has a lot of sound leaking into it, which usually comes from a window, like say someone sitting in their driveway, idling their car, blasting music because they think everyone else in the neighborhood wants to hear it, or your computer has a really loud fan, or your air conditioning turned on, or your puppy's barking at some rodents outside that he can't see beyond the fence, then, you, you know, you'd probably want to go with a shotgun microphone, right, Rip? Rip? Shot <laughs> shotgun microphone? Speak into it, buddy. Go ahead. <laughs> a shotgun microphone usually has what's known as a low bar polar pattern, meaning the polar pattern is a lot tighter than a standard cardioid large diaphragm condenser microphone. So it's going to have a tighter pickup pattern and not pick up all of these sounds. Sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> not pick up all of these sounds nearly as much as it would if you were using a large diaphragm condenser microphone. Right, Rip? Ripperoo? Am I right? Is it okay? Do you like that microphone? <laughs> no, you don't. Good boy. Do you want to go watch that? Wee! Good boy. <laughs> That's a perfect example of what I'm talking about, you know. You'd want a shotgun microphone. It'd still pick that up, but not as much as a large diaphragm condenser mic. Right, Rip? Anyway, you get the idea. Whereas a LDC microphone usually has what's known as a cardioid polar pattern. A cardioid polar pattern means that you'll speak into one side of the microphone like you're seeing me do right now, and the audio will slowly be rejected the further and further you get to the side of the microphone, and the audio will be heavily rejected at the back 
of the microphone. This means that you can move a little further left and a little further right on a microphone like this without the audio losing too much clarity because like I just said, with the cardioid polar pattern, you get a little bit more leeway as you move left and right. Whereas with a low bar polar pattern, a shotgun microphone has a really tight polar pattern, meaning if you're not standing right in front of the microphone, or better yet, you don't have the tip of the microphone pointed close to your mouth, the audio clarity will suffer because the low bar polar pattern rejects audio that's coming from the side and the back of the microphone way more drastically than the cardioid polar pattern. So you just don't have the freedom of moving left and right off the microphone nearly as much as you do with a cardioid polar pattern. A shotgun microphone, a, a, you know, a low bar polar pattern, it's just much tighter. So you have to make sure you're really on, you know, your microphone technique has to be really good. You have to really be on that microphone. Whereas with a large diaphragm condenser microphone, you get a little more leeway left and right on that microphone. N now, you know, when it comes to a shotgun microphone, this can be great when it comes to recording spaces that have a little too much noise in them that maybe you can't control as much as you would like. Now, there are quite a few polar patterns out there, more than the two that I just talked about. And if you'd like to learn more about them, check out the video I made in the description below where I go through and, and explain polar patterns and how they differ on different microphones and all the different ones. All right, now one quick note about shotgun microphones. There are videos going around the YouTube stating that uh, shotgun microphones, if used in smaller reverberant spaces, will cause phase cancellation, which makes them not good for voiceover work. Now the first part of that statement is true, while the second part is just misinformed. Yes, this can happen while using a shotgun microphone in a smaller reverberant space. However, if you made the choice to pursue voiceover as a career, the first thing you should be doing when it comes to your audio is properly acoustically treating the space that you're going to be recording in. This will completely alleviate that whole phase cancellation thing. So in other words, shotgun microphones are great for voiceover work. It's it's just how you're using the shotgun microphone and in what space and did you acoustically treat it and all that good stuff. I mean, out of the hundreds of people that I know that do voiceover, like half of them are using a shotgun microphone in a smaller recording space like I am right now in this video. Not to mention all of the biggest voice actors in the world, like half of them use shotgun microphones. I mean, take Joe Cipriano, for example. He's always using a 416, and he's in a small booth. So anyway, yes, shotgun microphones are great for voiceover work. But this all really comes back to the first thing I said at the beginning of this video, which is the the key, the biggest key to having professional-sounding audio is how you acoustically treat the space you're recording in. It's not the microphone. It's actually your recording space. 70 to 80% of having professional-sounding audio is how you acoustically treat the space that you're recording in. And this can be a bit complicated, it, it, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into treating a space. Every space is different, so it's going to require its own treatment methods to make that space sound good. No one space is the same, so every one space can't have a blanket, you know, one-size-fits-all treatment, unfortunately. I wish it were that way. It'd be a lot easier, but it, every space is different. So if you do need help figuring out how to properly treat your specific space, what to use, where to place all of the stuff in your space, among many other things, you can sign up for a private consultation. Link in the description of this video. We'll get back to that topic a bit at the end of the video, but okay, so you've decided between a USB or XLR microphone, and then you've decided between a large diaphragm condenser or shotgun microphone. Well, now what? Well, every microphone has what's known as an EQ curve or a frequency response. Broken down simply, this just means that each microphone has its own particular sound. Some microphones sound really bright and crispy, and some microphones sound really dark or warm, while some microphones sound right in between which is known as like a flat response. Well, when it comes to voiceover, this doesn't matter as much as you might have been led to believe. What mic sounds best for your voice doesn't really make a difference in the voiceover world, believe it or not, not as much as you might think. I'm making a video all about this sometime in the next few weeks to really break this down and dive deep into it, but long video short, as long as you choose a microphone that fits the criteria that we've covered already in this video, you're good to go, that's it. That's why any studio or individual that's offering something called a microphone shootout, where you can go into this person's studio or space to try out a bunch of different microphones to find out which one best fits your voice, is a flat out scam. They either don't know enough about audio to understand why this doesn't matter, and ignorance is no excuse, or they're preying on voiceover newbies to make a little extra money off of them. Not good either way.
The other thing that makes microphone shootouts a scam is the fact that you would be trying out those microphones in that person's or studio space, not your space. And remember, everyone's space is different and will require its own specific methods of treatment. Because of this, you would need to try out these mics in your space to truly know if they're the right microphone for your space, your voice, and just you in general. But again, it really doesn't matter regardless because as long as you choose a microphone that fits the criteria we've covered in this video, you're good to go. Now, there are some situations where people might need to worry about the EQ curve of a microphone, and I'll definitely cover that in the video I'm making, but it's literally like 1% of people that would need to worry about this. One of my main goals on my channel, as you've heard me say many, many times, is to help save you money and to help you avoid scams. Moving on. All right, and finally back to it, what I was talking about earlier, the most important part of having professional sounding audio, you can have a $3,000 microphone, but if you haven't properly treated the recording space that you're recording in, it's gonna sound like garbage. End of story, that's all there is to it. A few of the most common materials used to treat a space acoustically is foam, blankets, acoustic panels, even clothes, obviously, as you can see here. Clothes are fantastic. You know, cushions, pillows, all of those good things uh, that you can get started in your closet with right away. And foam is one that's blasted at voice actors, content creators, and musicians all the time as some kind of magic fix-all, when in reality, foam is like the worst thing you could choose to acoustically treat a space. And I know you're like, yeah, but James, you have foam in your space. I'll get to that. Foam doesn't work the way that you expect foam to work. And it's one of those things that's like heavily, heavily pushed at voice actors and content creators and musicians all over the interwebs for whatever reason. And it's like the worst thing that you can use to acoustically treat a space. It, you know, there are much, much better things. Now, if you really, really know what you're doing, you can utilize foam in your space and make it work. However, I've made an entire video, link in the description, it's one of the most important videos that you can watch, where I break down why foam doesn't work. And in the video, I also talk about how I made foam actually work in my space. But if you'd like to see that video, it's in the description below. It's a really important video, I highly recommend watching it. Long story short, don't fall for the foam scam. You will not get the desired effects that you're after. It will be way more frustrating than it's worth, I assure you. If you want a straightforward option that will give you the desired effect that you're after quickly and efficiently, go with acoustic panels. I have a really easy to follow video tutorial on how to make your own custom acoustic panels that can save you some money if you'd like to do that rather than just buy them from a retailer, if that's something that you'd like to do. Hopefully that video will be coming out in the next month or two, but I'll link it below whenever it is out. But if you don't know where to place those acoustic panels, it's not gonna sound that great. You know, if you place them in the wrong area, it might cause other issues. It's still gonna sound kind of boxy and kind of weird. You need to make sure that you're placing those panels in the right place. And that's part of what I cover in my home studio consultation, as well as just walking you through what to do in your specific space, where to place stuff, what would be best for you. Because there's, there's places and spaces where acoustic panels actually don't work that well. And we have to go a different route. There's many various different methods. Um, that's what I cover in my consultation. Anyway, if you'd like any kind of help with your home studio, link in the description. Now, as far as what mic you should choose, well, I have a video coming out listing the top 10 microphones that I recommend for voiceover. And whenever that video is out, I'll link it in the description below as well. But I'll always recommend the Rode NT1 fifth generation. It sounds great, it's super affordable, it gives you both USB and XLR connectivity, so you could just buy this microphone to start out, use it in its USB mode, and then one day if you decide to upgrade to an audio interface, you can connect it via XLR and you're good to go. Best of both worlds. If you want to see the full review I did of this microphone, I'll leave a link to that video in the description as well. I really hope you got a lot out of this video. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions or comments or anything like that, and let me know which microphone you are recording on in the comments below and why you chose that microphone. What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? And when it comes to what's the best microphone for voiceover, well, you know what they say.